We're going to talk about Jesus' baptism of death tonight. Classroom etiquette, you understand, at least those who are with us in the classroom understand, and so I speak to those as well who are visiting with us by Internet. Classroom etiquette, it's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Therefore, you have to learn it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You can't study the Bible in carnality. What would be evidence of carnality in a Christian's life? Well, personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. Okay, what do I do? Okay, here, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That restores us into the, the work of sanctification for Bible study, the work of the Holy Spirit to teach us the truth of the Word of God. So I give it a moment of your priesthood, just a moment in your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, where your priest identity is found, to confess your own sins to the Father. And the work of Christ on the cross will be exercised within your life in regard to forgiveness and cleansing, restore you to fellowship. So our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way both by the internet as well as those who have drove into us because they're close in distance. Now, I'm appreciative of that because I'm a face-to-face -face pastor. It is what I've been called in my personal life and my personal ministry to do. And so I'm thankful for that. I pray tonight, Father, as we look at the four different baptisms of Jesus in our series, we've looked at John's baptism of Jesus and what that was important about the Jesus' baptism by John. We're looking tonight at the Jesus' baptism of death out of this passage. It's interesting to me, Father, that it's only recorded in two of the gospel books. And the significance of it would, would be important. It's found in Luke and in Mark. I pray today, Father, that the Holy Spirit might minister the truth of this to our souls and see how we're identified with it. What does that mean for me today in the reality of my life? As much as it did for James and John when he said, okay, you will drink the cup and you will be baptized with the baptism then how does that relate to us? For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're looking at, we're looking at in our series, we're looking at the four baptisms associated with Jesus that I, I, at least the writers thought it was important. And he mentioned, as I told you uh, in uh, verse 32, and again he took the 12 aside, and again he took the 12 aside and taught them the same lesson. Now, in Mark, the seventh chapter, I wrote this on the top of your paper so you could do it later in your own study to see the first time he taught it in the book of Mark was in Mark 8, 27 through 33. The second time is in the ninth chapter, verses 30 through 32. The third time, which is our passage, is in Mark 10, 32 through 40. The next time will be the actual reality of it in Mark 14, 14 through 23. That will be the fourth. Tonight, we're going to try to work our way through six aspects of this baptism of, of death. Now, we looked at, when we read it through, point number one was, I broke this thing down into three homiletical points for us. Verses 32 through 34 was the sermon or the lesson. I was looking for S words, so I put this as the sermon or the lesson he taught his people. It's crucifixion, Passover. They're headed in Mark 10. They're headed into Passover. And this will be the Passover is crucifixion. And Jesus' suffering is being foretold. His suffering. Uh, that's what verse 34 and 34 is about. Behold, we are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him to the Gentiles. 
and they will mock him. They will spit on him. They will scourge him. They will kill him. And three days later, he'll rise again. And so Jesus is later going to call that his, he's going to call this, he's going to call it his cup and his baptism, right? And later, that's what he's going to call it. And when we do the Eucharist, we actually participate in that cup. He says this in, for example, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. we read this every, every first Sunday of the month when we do Eucharist. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this often as you do this in remembrance of me. And so there are two things. People, because the cup just kind of dominates because of the Eucharist in the church, uh, the, uh, and, and the cup of his blood of the new covenant dominates, we spend very little time on the death that does the same thing. The baptism of death, even though we're talking about the same thing. He calls this, verses 33 and 34, he calls it the cup and the baptism, right? right? He says, I have a cup. To, we, we understand this. As you read through the book, when you get to the end of this book, you will come to understand that. Then uh, the, 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 the sons of thunder, uh, staying with my S. The, the sons of thunder, James and John, um, they throw their Bible lesson away and get into a discussion with him what's important to them, not what's important to him. And it doesn't take you long as a teacher to know that that's a kind of a common classroom thing and you, you're always teaching the people that have come to learn because you can't teach to people who have come not to learn. And so early in my ministry, I focused on people who came wondering why would you come and not have a desire to learn. And uh, that's a waste of time and energy to do that. And it doesn't serve the people who have come to learn. And so as long as they're not disruptive to those who have come to learn, you finally learn just, just be quiet, let the Lord deal with them, right? And I don't have the power as a normal teacher in a normal class to give them zeros. <laughs> so I have to depend on the Lord to do that. And I found out he does it well. So, um, and they make a childish request, don't they? They work them. They're, they're so childish. And if he's got, you, when your kids do this with you, you have to laugh at it. I mean, how, how many kids, everybody gets worked this way, right? I mean, I remember doing it. When I was going over this, I, could, I can remember times when I tried to pull that. They didn't get very far because it's so childish. And an adult in the room knows it, but if, if you just have a bunch of, well, I don't see why your parents, you see, if you're with a bunch of peers, well, I don't see why your parents didn't do that <laughs> because they're too smart. <laughs> hopefully. Um, so they make this childish request and he, uh, he answers them like, a, like an adult. Well, I'm not going to commit myself before I know what you want. Would you give me anything I want? Well, I don't. <laughs> and, and listen, as soon as they open their mouth, like, like a good parent knows, as soon as they open their mouth, you know what it's about. It's selfish, it's self-centered, it's egotistic, it's got no substance, right? Only the adult in the room knows that. But there always should be at least one in the room. And they want a crown. They want the crown before the cross. He talking about the cross, they go like, I don't want to talk about the cross, I want to talk about the crown, right? So they throw that whole lesson Bible study out. I'm not interested in that. They came to class. He said, listen, let me tell you something important to me that will be important to you. They go like, hmm, I don't think so. I, uh, I'm after some glory, not gory. I'm after glory, not gory. Okay. Because you just talk. When you get through preaching lately, Jesus, I'm just depressed. Right? Because that's just kind of the way he's been... Um,
So I, I find some consolation in all this because they threw their, their pastor under the bus too. And wow, there's no way I could even compare with him as a teacher, in my opinion. <laughs> so every once in a while I get a, I get a, I, I get a piece of meat thrown to me and, a, and it's helpful. And so in verses 35, as we read through 38, they go through that. And then verse 38, Jesus says to him, you do not know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup I drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism for which I'm baptized? He knows their answer because they threw his lesson away. They didn't want it. it they wanted glory, not gory. And so they threw all that away. And he, So in verse 39, they said to him, yeah, we're able. Let's get on to the serious stuff. <laughs> Why do you think I asked the question? Of course I'm able. Why do you think I even ask? Of course I'm able. <laughs> oh, that's another childish idea. Jesus said to them, the cup I drink, you shall drink. You shall be baptized with the baptism of which I am baptized. But to set on my right or on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those. In other words, they were on the right track. There is going to be a right and a left. There are going to be seats in the glory. In his glory. In his glory. There's going to be seats. But not even he could assign them. Think about that. I mean, he's top guy. And he couldn't even do it. And so I, I found a split answer. Listen to it. He said yes and no to their request, right? He said yes and no. He gave me yes and no. And I, I suppose he does that a lot with us. We just are really interested in the yeses and not the noes, right? He did it. We studied this the other day in 2 Corinthians 12 with when Paul, he did the same thing to Paul. You know, when he asked, right, three times to have that removed, he said no, but yes. And I suppose we learn a great deal about prayer from that. I'm not going to give you what's going to be bad for you, but I will give you what's going to be good for you. So here's the good part of the prayer you got. And the bad part of the prayer, thank God, you, know, <laughs> you won't get it. It's good. So I, I, I just, I find that kind of interesting to me because normally we think of our request and our prayers as either a, a no or a yes, but probably most of the time they're split. Could. Could he be thinking of the kingship again? Oh, sure he is. Sure he is. I mean, he always, listen, he always, he's always concerned about where you are right now and where God has planned for you to go. You always find that in how he, how he, how he responds to you. He did that with Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, and he's doing it here. Yeah. They have no idea what they're asking for. Listen, they could be short-selling themselves. They think, oh, big deal, man. It would be... The biggest thing. and listen, their request guys are sitting around going like, oh, "Why didn't I ask first? Mm, right? Yeah. Because they became indignant. They went like, mm, "They got me again." And you know, Peter's thinking that. I mean, you just got to know he's thinking that way. They were competitive. They were competitive in their business life, weren't they? I can catch more fish than you can. Well, it's just interesting. Uh, no and a yes. No, I, you're not going to sit on my right and the left. It's not no in the sense that I can't give that to you. I don't have that. That's We say that's above my pay grade, right? <laughs> you wouldn't think that either. You'd be above his pay grade, wouldn't you? Um, Jesus' baptism of death is recorded in Mark 10 and in Luke 12:50. The Jesus cup is also used for spiritual death. 
and it became prominent in the church is because of the Eucharist, like in 1 Corinthians 11, 25. So you can see I spent a, a little while, and I could go on and talk about this a great deal, just the way this is broken down. So you can see how important it is, for, at least the way I talk. I want to get a good understanding of my passage in order to bring my lesson. And so I, I, I try to share as much as how I develop my thinking and where it comes from. I want you to understand that what I'm trying to tell you tonight, as most nights, comes from the authority of the Word of God as best I understand it. And I try to break it down in the best I can understand. You know, when we used to do public speaking, this, this would be your outline, say, and... Um, That was probably one of the best courses I ever took in my life because it taught me how to outline my, my mind, it, uh, orderly thinking. Uh, but anyhow, and so I still do that because it helps me. So these, this is kind of like my outline <laughs> for a doctrinal way to go. Uh, point number two is Jesus Christ taught his disciples about his passion Passover. Now, when I talk about passion, I'm not talking about emotion. I'm talking about his suffering. Uh, wasn't that called the pat? Wasn't that the passion that that that? The yeah, the passion of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that's the way I'm using it here, uh, the Passion Passover. Uh, but they listen, and that's verses two, uh, thirty-two to thirty-four. Remember that was his Bible study, his, and he talks about his Passion Passover. But they didn't cycle into the faith until listen to me until after his resurrection. Now, they took it in, but they didn't cycle it, right? You know the cycle where you hear it, you believe it, and then you apply it. Um, listen, inhale, exhale is, is absolutely essential when you go to Bible study. If you can't cycle it in class, then, then you got to work on it. I mean, the very next morning Bible study ought to be that. Do you understand it? Because cycling it is very important. Um, it's got to be on the front burner uh, of your faith system. I mean, it's got to be believed in order for it to become faith. Faith, faith the, abs at the application of what you believe is what, where faith is developed in your life. <laughs> and that's so important. That, that's that 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 business. But they didn't. But... Afterwards, uh, listen to this out of John 12, 16. I wrote this on your paper for you. These things his disciples did not understand at the first. Now watch the when then. You always pay attention to these. These are time words in a passage. You always pay attention to them. But when Jesus was glorified, that is, he died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead, and went back to heaven. When Jesus was glorified. Then they remembered that these things were written of him. See, now, now they're, they're talking about, they're, now they're starting to put the pieces together of their, from their Bible, which was Old Testament. So you got, you've got somebody like Paul come out in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, talking about the gospel, which is a person. It's not a thing. It's a person. And, he, and he's going to say, he came and died for your sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised from the dead, according to the scripture. Just like us, people have got to have the word of God in, in context of how it is to be applied to life or to faith, right? In order for it to be developed in them. And so, um, they only took this halfway. And why did they stop halfway? I'll tell you why they stopped halfway and why you do. You ready? Because of false assumption. And, it, and listen, you could have five different people or more in a room like this. You could give it out. The, those five that went halfway with it and didn't take it all the way to, to the faith cycle, 
they would all have five different reasons as a rule, unless they all came from the same religious background, educational background, social background, et cetera, et cetera, then they might have the same answer. But other than that, there would have to be a lot of pieces fit together in that puzzle of their life for five people to all agree. And they would have to have a lot of social different uh, 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 similarities. But I say that to say that when they remembered these things, they went back in the Word of God and began to put their messianic passages together. And now, see, they understand these things. Well, listen, he said that he had to go to Jerusalem and he was going to be this, and he was going to be that, and, blah, 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 blah. and they started going, where in the scriptures does they have? Bring them up, put it down, documenting. That's what we have in the Gospels. They documented it. In the book of Acts, they documented it. Then they fell apart. They were, by the time we get to Acts 15, they were all in agreement that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that he came to die for the sins of the world, be buried, and raised from the dead third day. And that would be the gospel of salvation, right? They all agreed to it. Then they departed on, yes, but you have to have the law in order for this to work. They even went so far to say, you've got to be a Jew in order, in circumcision. They, you've got to have circumcision. You, Jesus was a Jew. You've got to be a Jew. So there were a lot of, even though they, and the disciples from the Gospels, what we read in the Gospels and the book of Acts, the disciples here, when it clicked, when it began to click, they began to go into their Bible and they began to write doctrines, messianic doctrines. They started laying them out. And we are benefited by, by that in the early church. And by Acts 15, now we have another problem, law versus grace. Uh, the 70 AD helped us with that a little bit, but the devil already had a foot a, a foothold in the church with false doctrine. And we still battle it today, in my opinion. It's just my opinion. Uh, when then, um, and, they had, and they had done these things to him that, that bothered them, that they were players in this, that bothered them. There's a verse. I, w I want you to grab this verse. I, I want you to put your eyes on it, though, because... This important verse, this is one of those verses, it's in 1 Timothy 2.4. For me, 1 Timothy 2.4 is one of those verses that's just like 2 Peter 3.9. You know, in 2 Peter 3.9, uh, God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. You know, for me, that's a landmark verse, for me. I mean, that, that's kind of one of those verses that keep me is stable about what I know about God. It, 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 you know, God is not willing that any perish, not one. And he sent his son so that not one would perish. I mean, everybody's saved by the same thing, by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. But 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy for me is another one of those, for me, it's one of those landmark um, passages like 2 Peter of three nine that 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 kind of keep me stable with that first uh, first Timothy two four says uh, God the who there is God because of verse three who desires all men God in other words God it's one of these things again God desires right it's a God desire God desires all men to be saved number one watch this number two and to come. Now, there's a very interesting subjunctive, and you'll hear me talk about that a great deal because we typically overlook it. It's called the adjunction, the adjunctive conjunction. It's spelled A-D-J, adjunction, like conjunction, adjunction. It's an adjunctive conjunction, and, and it's a chi uh, as a rule. And it connects two things that are similar. It could be two nouns. It could be two verbs. It could be whatever. So, and you can see it in the English. So every once in a while, I want to show it to you because this is an ad adjunctive conjunction. Watch this. God desires all men to be saved. See that? See the two be saved? Now watch. And see the two? And to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
They, when you see those, you, you know when you see that, you can see it in English, un, un, unless the Greek is so far away from the English, it usually isn't that far. It's an adjunctive. It means that these two things are linked by the word and, and they're, they're linked important. In other words, here's what he means. God ha here's what this means. God, God's desire is equally important on these two issues. It, one is not more important to God. They're equally important to God's desire is what that means. So it, it's kind of really important because it would look like, well, it's important, and it is in the order of common sense. You, need, you have to be saved in order to come to knowledge of the truth, right? But as far as God's concerned, they are equally important in his plan. Now, I say that to you because you are saved. You've got that first one down. Would you agree? You, you, I mean, you've satisfied God's desire. You believe that Jesus died for your, for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. That's it. I mean, you got that one. Whew. All right. The second one is as equally important to God in his plan, and that is, that now that you're saved, you come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because in John 8, 32, the truth sets you free. So listen, it's, it's not enough. And I say to these people all the time on the internet as well as in my hearing, listen, how important is Bible study to your life? How important is it? Well, let me ask you. How, let me ask you then. How important it is, is it in your heart for the rest of the world to be safe like you? If that's as important, then let me tell you, if that's as important to you, that's important to God. But let me tell you, the second part of that is just as important to God. And how do you view that? How do you view that? I mean, I mean, See, for me, that second part to me, I, I, I somehow I just knew that was vitally important to me. Do what? Is it true? Is it? Well, it is, I guess, isn't it? I mean, you're not going to get it without them. But truth is, truth is what we're looking for, maybe in a practical way. What's the truth about a decision I got to make? may be about another job. It may be about my marriage. It may be about my children. It may be about my health. It may be about this, about that. Because, I mean, truth is what we're after. What is the truth? that? What can I believe to carry me from point A to point B? And know that God supports that decision I make. You know, for me, truth is about me having the confidence to make a decision that God will support. I mean, wh when I go out there, I go out there when I, truth for me puts me out on thin ice. I mean, there's no way I can possibly do that. Ain't no, no possible way I can come up. Listen, I've been in this church 44 years. There's no possible way I could stop and think, well, let's see, three times a week, 52 weeks in a year, 44 years. How many sermons is that? See, I have, I have friends, they have a, a repertoire of sermons, and when they run out, they go to another church. Well, I don't have, I mean, that never crossed my mind. What crossed my mind was Criswell, who spoke to our, my senior class and said, well, you need to find a church and sit down and stay for at least three, three generations of people so you can see the word of God work in people's lives through families. And so, and he had been, at that time he spoke to us, he had been pastor of Dallas First Baptist Church for 25 years. And that, boy, that stuck. I went, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, I mean, that, there's no way I could do that. I mean, if I sat down and thought that out in advance, that would well, it'd drive me nuts. It'd drive me nuts. I don't, but I don't have to. I take the Bible. I've been doing, there's so much in it I haven't even explored in the way I would like to in teaching. 
I, I don't know. I'm just talking about me. I, I, I don't know about other people. I'm not, listen, I'm not, I wouldn't, whatever work, these guys are out there, they've got calls of God on their life, and I support that. And however their system is and their life is okay. For me, it wasn't that system. That wasn't a system I could be content with. That, that's just me. I'm not saying everybody ought to do what I do. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I have to do this. But look, why is it they don't understand? They, they brought it halfway. And I'm telling you, it's a false assumption. They, they Listen, they believe that there is a crown without a cross. That's a false assumption. And he's tried to break through that false assumption, hasn't he? It's like people, legalist people, you can talk to your blue in the face. They got, they're holding on to a false assumption. And listen, you, you tell them the truth and walk away. You still love them. Still love them. I mean, you're, you, just because they don't agree with you don't mean you, you're not supposed to love them. Still love them. But false assumption leads to false interpretations that leads to false expectation, leads to false application. We learned that in the book of Job. Th these people want a, cro they want a crown without a cross. They threw the lesson under the bus, as I say. The third thing, listen, and for all of us here tonight, including myself, this point is for us. We got mature people in here. Their failure to inhale and exhale, 2 Timothy 3.16, God breathed, all scripture is God breathed. When I say inhaled and exhaled, God breathed, all scripture is God breathed and is profitable. Okay? The failure to inhale and exhale categorical Bible doctrine, in other words, doctrine that's pertinent to the teacher to teach you, like Jesus was saying, we're going to Jerusalem. You know why we're going to Jerusalem? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to McDonald's. We don't have one in my town. No, that's not why we're going. Here's why we're going. Okay? Their failure to inhale and exhale, categorical Bible doctrine, and by that I mean take it to the full circle where they can inhale and exhale. They're inhaling halfway and holding it. Okay. That don't work very good for, for in, inhale and exhale. The failure to inhale and exhale, categorical Bible doctrine, real result, in having nothing to apply in the crisis of life, which resulted in unthinkable desertion. Agreed? All these scattered. The shepherd, he told them ahead of time, he said, the shepherd's going to be struck. Sheep are going to run. Well, everybody but me, Lord. You're going to me. And listen, it is interesting that when, when they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter went packing. Right? He's packing. You know when I say packing? All right. And listen, he meant to use it. Did he use it? Yeah? And listen, nothing wrong with that, except it was a wrong fight. Nothing wrong with that. It was a wrong fight. He was fighting against the plan of God with that. Listen, he, he's packing because they were being, his, his guy was being threatened to be murdered, right? He went packing. We're about, to have a, we're about to have a conference here with some of the key people talking about security around us since this church out in Podunk got hit. I mean, who's safe now, right? So we're, we'll be having a meeting uh, about sensible security now we know god's in charge of all that i understand we understand all that there's still some sensible things i believe that i still lock my house at night i hope you lock your cars when you come here if you've got anything valuable in it right lock it somebody said to me yeah well you can lock the car but how about the engine the tires i went to buffalo new york I went to Buffalo, New York. I was with Billy Graham. I went to Buffalo, New York. I had a meeting with the vice president of a big bank. He said, look, it, I'm downtown. You pull right up to the front of the, of the bank, 
park your car, it'll be okay because we have security and come on up. I said, can I park there in front of Bangalore? Yeah, that's the only place to park and be safe. I went, <laughs> Buffalo, New York. I went, oh my God, what do I got into? So I go up, I got a rental. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I had a rental. I went upstairs, I spent an hour with this guy. He was part of our team, uh, local team. I came down, no wheels. No wheels. I was up there an hour in front of a bank <laughs> to rental as one of those Toronto or something like that, one of those Fords. It was a good little car I rented. I used to always rent those. And, uh, and uh, of course, we didn't have cell phones back then, so I, I rushed back upstairs. <laughs> a bank. I thought about a bank in front of a bank. It was, it was the middle of the day. There was no night meeting. I would have went down there at night, not even for Billy Graham. <laughs> uh, but you can read about their desertion in Matthew 26. I, I put it on your paper. Um, I mean, how is it possible? Listen, how is it possible as much as we love Christ, as much as we appreciate the word of God? Listen to me. Think how many times, think how many times we're right up the edge of deserting, right up the edge. I mean, we don't like the pastor. We don't like the plays. We don't like this. We don't like that. Oh, he teaches the same old thing. I don't like the choir. I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm going someplace else. They never wind up anyplace else. I've been here 44 years. I, I said we should have called our church. You used to go. <laughs> I used to go there. Then we'd have had it named right. His disciples, listen, here's the point. His disciples had moral courage like Peter drawing his sword at Gethsemane. They had moral courage. But Peter had moral courage. Mark 14, 46 through 50. But they didn't have doctrinal faith to fight the good fight of faith. Let me tell you, no matter how much moral courage you have as a Christian, if you don't have the fight of faith, the fight of faith is what you're after. Nothing wrong with moral courage, but it doesn't hold a candle to the fight of faith. Not a candle. Peter had moral courage. Listen, all these disciples had moral courage. They were probably all packing. I mean, they went, if they're going to take, they're not taking them. And Peter proved that. He had that mindset, didn't he? And more than likely, they all were there. But Peter packed. Peter packed a pack of pickles or something. I don't know where he packed. <laughs> I know I started something now. Now your head's gone. Come on back. Uh, sorry I led you off. Fight the good fight of faith in 1 Timothy 6.12. See, they're, 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 listen, Peter had moral courage. He drew his sword. He, he fought his fought, fight, and it was wrong, wasn't it? It wasn't the fight. Listen, this was the time to pull the sword of the word of God, right? Jesus told them that too, didn't he? If you know anything about the story. They were willing to fight and die for what they believed, but what they believed was wrong. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. It is the, it, this is the victory that overcomes the world. I had them sing that song last week. My, my music guy always takes my request. I'm so thankful for him. If anybody's got a better music guy than I got, I'd like to know it. Got that nice deep voice that I need. I hear him, I go, like, I'm okay. Oh, way down there. I like that. Four, Jesus' baptism of death is not about self-interest. Listen to me, it's about sin interest. Jesus' baptism of death is not about self-interest. It's about sin interest. Jesus' interest is the sin issue of Mark 10, 32 to 34. His disciples didn't buy into it. They will later, but they're not buying into it now. Listen, you know when you need to buy into the word of God is when they tell you you need it. 
Now, it's good that you got it later. God bless the word of God, never returns void. I love that idea. But listen, when you, when you got it on your front step and you're at the front step, it's time, time, not, now it's time to use it. Agreed? Because, listen, it pays dividend in the plan of God. It pays dividends in the plan of God. I mean, you never want to miss an opportunity because it pays high dividends. That Now you're into 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, or however that went. I forget what the folds were, but I like the idea of their folds. You know? Jesus' interest is the sin issue. His interest is doing the will of God and not his own, right? I mean, that, listen, listen, and listen, sometimes there's a struggle with surrender. Oh, come on now. <laughs> They played poker now with me. Listen, sometimes there's a struggle with surrender. But you must win it. You must win it for Christ. Nothing wrong with a struggle. It's how it comes out. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. That overcomes the world. Listen. This is interesting to me because. This is our life too. Disciples had. The, what I call the negative volition. Of complacency. They appear positive. But only do what they want to hear. He tells them. You guys on the front steps, yeah? Well, here's front step sermon. This you're going to need to get to the next place. You're at this level. To get to the next level, you're going to need this. We're going to Jerusalem, and here's what you got to have. They all sit there and take notes. He turns around. They fold up throw it away. <laughs> they appear... As they have positive volition, but the truth of the matter is they have negative volition of complacency. They pick and choose what they want to what they want to believe and what they want to apply. Pick and choose. You can't do that. Oh, you say yes, I can. Well, I know you can do that. But that's negative volition. It's not positive volition. If you go to Bible study and you go negative, what what the Word of God tells you is truth, you got a problem, haven't you? Oh, please tell me you got somebody's got one. They sat in class. Listen, here's a clue. You sat in class. Listen to me. Here's the struggle of surrender. Now I'm. A little, I'm a, you know, I, we're going to get this now. You sat in class, and you keep your and you do not keep your mind on study. You don't keep it on study. So why is that? Because you think whatever your mind's on is more important than why God has set you in class with a guy who has been logging it all day long, praying all day long with God to touch people's heart with this message that I have no clue why we're doing this. I just know that God knows what's going on in people's life and my job is to bring it with clarity. And when you come to class, prepared to get that, and you find, listen, I'm telling you, sometimes there's a struggle with surrender. Now do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that it's that, listen, I'm not saying there's not a struggle when you come to class and you start to float. Listen, I'll tell you where, where you're liable to start to float is when you think I'm running a rabbit trail. I go off on a subject somehow or another, and you might not see the relation to it, and maybe there is none. Maybe it's just therapy for me. Maybe it's just therapy for me. For whatever reason is going on, there's something going on within the pastor, something's going on. You're still stay, required to stay focused. You know, the disciple's going along, he's teaching this great Bible lesson, we used to have it over at Woodlong. It seemed like every time we got into something really thick, that fire 
they would have, that fire engine would come. Do you remember that? That fire engine would come out. <laughs> well, you, you might as well just shut it down. I mean, it, it is, it's just like somebody running through there saying, fire, there's a fire, there's a fire. To hear that out there. <laughs> then everybody starts sniffing. <laughs> right? And so you go like, Psh. The issue is not, listen, the issue for you is not who is my teacher, but what is the truth being taught? That's the truth. Whether you like me or not is not really the big issue. You know, not going to, not going to go to lunch with you anyhow. <laughs> right? I mean, you're not going to invite me and I'm not going to go anyhow. It's not because I don't like you. It's just not going to go. That's just who I am. This got nothing to do with anything. But the issue is not who is my teacher. The issue is what is truth being taught? Is the, is, rather, what, what is the truth? John talks about this in the eighth chapter, really important. And five, and I got to get out of here. I, I was ambitious tonight. I was like that James and John asking for the two say when I went, I'm going to give you six points. I saw you look and smile like, yeah, right. <laughs> Jesus' baptism of death was a suffering on the cross for the sin death of the entire human race. That's what his baptism is. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He bore our sins on his body. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. Now, I'm going to have to save number six because I'm out of time, and that's, that's really important. So the next time we come back, I'm going to cover this. I'm going to do a much more extensive study on, on number six. Every church-age believer is identified with Jesus' baptiz baptism of death the moment he believes the gospel, and we call that retroactive positional truth in theology. We call it retroactive positional truth. And when we come back next time, I'm going to go into a much deeper discussion on that. Um, that, will be the, that will be helpful to you because that's the theology that came out of this that disciples didn't get but later got, right? What he was raised. They go back and they look at that and they say, look, and you're going to find, I'm going to show you something else. When, when I got interested in this, like this, I went, what in the Old Testament could we ever connect the baptism of death with? And so the next time when I talk about retroactive position, they can't ever get there without it. So where was that found? Um, we, the cup was easy to find because it was the old covenant cup. And, but finding the baptism of death. And so I'm going to talk about that next time and um, as well as retroactive positional truth. So uh, give me just a moment. Give me just a moment, then, I, then we're going to get out of here. Um, I better write that down. Retroactive positional truth. Baptism of death in Old Testament Messianic doctrine. Okay, I'll write that down because that 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 can't that was a wing. <laughs> I know I never remember that until I get here next time. All right. Father, we're so thankful for this time together. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this and that we as believers would be uh, to under, we need to come to a place of understanding. We need to come to a place of believing. And then we need to come to a place of applying. And we've talked about a lot of different aspects tonight. About the disciples and this, this great sermon that Jesus preached. And, and how, they, how they struggled within it until later. So... We were, we were in a whole lot of things tonight. And I pray the Holy Spirit would minister all that 
of, of significant importance to our life. In Jesus' name, amen.